So why are these different derivatives so grossly, dramatically different in reactivity? Well, I'm going to try to answer that from two perspectives. First one in this movie is where I'm just going to look at the different structures of the different acid derivatives and think about what effect does it have upon the electronic structure in moving from chlorine for the acid chlorides to oxygen for the acid anhydrides and esters to nitrogen in the amides. And then in the next movie, where I start talking about reactions, I'm going to look at the mechanism of the big reaction done by these acid derivatives and see how the different structures um, contribute to differences within that mechanism. So first of all, let's think about the different structures. Here is our general acid derivative structure. We have the so-called acyl group here, the alkyl group, to the carbon to the double bond O. So that's the acyl group, this kind of remain constant, and then it is this X that changes. In acid chlorides, this X is chlorine. In acid anhydrides, acid themselves, and esters, this X is oxygen. And then in amides, this X is nitrogen. All three of those, chlorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, of course, have lone pairs, at least one lone pair. So I've illustrated one of those here. Now the discussion here is all going to be about resonance stabilization. Okay, the way in which we can move electrons between pi electrons, between pi bonds and lone pairs. Now, in order to do that, we have to have two things. We have to have electronegativity in that atoms want to have those electrons. And then we also have to have decent so-called overlap between the p orbitals of the two involved atoms that are going to allow that pi bond. OK, so let's think about this in two ways. First of all, pi electrons here from this carbon oxygen double bond can quite easily move in to being a lone pair on the oxygen. We've seen that many, many times before. There's no problem in terms of overlap, in terms of p orbitals, pi electrons, however you want to say it. Electrons just moving from the pi, in which of course you have a p orbital on the carbon, p orbital on the oxygen, overlapping to just move entirely into that p orbital. Now, of course, if that was all that was happened, this carbon will be left with a positive charge. No reason for that poor carbon to think, hey, why am I going to give up those electrons unless there's something there to compensate for it? And of course, the compensation will come from X, lone pair on X. Can this lone pair of electrons on X, if it's in a P orbital, have that P orbital overlap with the P orbital on this carbon so that those electrons move into a double bond there? So what we're going to be discussing is how feasible is this whole process, okay? How reasonable is it going to be to have this extra double bond here? Can we get the overlap between the p orbital on X and the p orbital on the carbon to put the lone pair of electrons into that double bond, okay? The more that we can get this structure, the more that we can spread the electrons out from one structure to the other structure, the more stable this molecule is going to be. Now, if we start off with the most reactive, the chloride, okay, we'd be looking at these two possible structures. This structure is terrible. OK, this structure is hardly going to exist at all because there is no good overlap here. We've got p orbital on the carbon. We'd have to have a p orbital on the chlorine. Well, carbon is in the second row, so that's a 2p orbital. Chlorine is in the third row, that's a 3p orbital. You're going to have terrible overlap between a really big 3p orbital and a much smaller 2p orbital. So we're going to have very, very poor overlap between the p orbitals, which means that this carbon chlorine double bond is not going to be a contributor at all. This really doesn't exist. So in other words, no stabilization of the pi electrons allowed acid chlorides very reactive because we can't stabilize this molecule. Up at the other end, this amide, there is the nitrogen with its lone pair sharing those with the carbon, moving therefore the pi electrons from the CO bond onto the oxygen. Well, let's think about how this matches up 
first of all, of course, nitrogen and carbon are both in the second period. So this p orbital and this p orbital quite happily to overlap to allow this pi bond here. OK, so very nice overlap. But then the other issue is that nitrogen, you know, we think of nitrogen as being electronegative. But when you think about it compared to chlorine and oxygen, it's less electronegative, only a little bit less electronegative than chlorine quite a bit less electronegative than oxygen. So nitrogen being less electronegative, going to be rather happy, well not happy, but certainly not thoroughly um, unhappy about it, to share these electrons, these lone pair electrons with the carbon. So what that means is that this is a very good contributor for an amide, and so therefore the amide is extra stable, the amide is less reactive. So again, reactivity, Amide less reactive, acid chloride most reactive because the stability goes the other direction. The acid chloride unstable or not stabilized by this contributor, the amide stabilized by spreading those electrons around. Now the oxygens of course are in the middle here. And I'm going to sort of anticipate a little bit here because um, if you think about first of all the overlap, well oxygen is in the same period as carbon. So therefore, the p orbitals on oxygen, the p orbitals on carbon, similar sized, you can have fine overlap here. So unlike here, in which the chlorine's orbitals weren't going to allow overlap, you can have good overlap. You can make this pi bond when we're dealing with an oxygen down here. However, of course, oxygen is much more electronegative than nitrogen, so oxygen's not going to necessarily want to share its electrons to the same extent. So let's take those arguments and apply them first First of all, to the acid anhydride. Acid anhydride, of course, you've got this oxygen here. These are the lone pair, the oxygen with the lone pair that we're interested in. It can go in two directions. It can go to the left hand, like this one, or it can go to the right hand, like that one. Okay. Um, either one of these identical to each other. So you might say to each other, oh, look, there's two possible structures that we can use here. Esters down here, still got an oxygen, still no problem sharing those electrons, so we get this species here. Now, I would have argued that you've got two possible extra resonance structures here, both of which can help stabilize the electrons around the molecule. Here, you've only got one of them. So I would have said, well, two is better than one. However, the arguments that I have seen, and I don't find these very satisfactory at all, is that it's not really two is better than one, okay? But it's really two halves are better, not as good as one, because you're not going to have both this and this. You've only got that one pair of electrons. Well, really, you've only got the one oxygen atom that can make that extra bond there. So therefore, it's not two versus one, it's half and a half versus one. Well, that right there I find unsatisfactory. And then I've also, and then they, they add to that by saying, well, actually, actually, these two halves aren't as good as the one. And because the two halves aren't as good as the one, the acetic anhydride is not as stabilized as the ester, thus the acetic anhydride is more reactive. Now you can take that as you want. I, there is a much better explanation of why the um, anhydrides are more reactive than the esters when we start thinking about the reaction mechanism. What I do want you to get out of this though is it certainly describes and explains why the acid chlorides are the most reactive by quite a long way and the amides are the least reactive by quite a long way. No good overlap here, good overlap for the other threes, less electronegative for the amide compared to the oxygen.